Welcome to the Talent Grow Show, where you can get actionable, results-oriented insight and advice on how to take your leadership, communication, and people skills to the next level and become the kind of leader people want to follow. And now, your host and leadership development strategist, Haleli Azulai. Welcome back to the Talent Grow Show. This is Haleli Azulai. I'm your leadership development strategist, and I'm excited to introduce you to episode 36, where my guest is Susan Scott. Susan and I talk about the term fierce conversations, which she coined and wrote books about, and what it means and why it's important that we have them, and also what is a common obstacle that we all face and how to overcome it when having these types of conversations, both at work and in our personal lives. Susan and I also talk about how to be more open and more transparent and invite the same from others. There is something that a lot of us are doing that might be getting in our way. And also why she thinks careful conversations are almost always failed conversations. In fact, we talk about the concept of radical transparency, which Susan advocates, and the difference between what fierce leaders are doing and what other leaders are doing. And of course, Susan shares one actionable suggestion that will help you upgrade your leadership and communication skills and will make a huge difference in the quality of your conversations and the quality of your relationships. And I think you should really begin doing it today as soon as you finish listening to this episode. So here we go. Episode 36. Let's go. Welcome back to the Talent Grow Show. I'm Haleli Azulai, your leadership development strategist, and I'm very happy to introduce you to today's guest, who is Susan Scott, the founder and CEO of a company called Fierce. She's also a speaker and a best-selling author of two books, Fierce Conversations and Fierce Leadership. Susan, welcome to the Talent Grow Show. Thank you, Haleli. It's a pleasure to be here. It is my pleasure to have you with us. And uh, before we get started sharing your amazing insights with our listeners, I always like to make sure that we get introduced to your professional journey in a very short amount of time. Can you describe where you started and how you got to where you are today? Well, I, I can describe the trajectory, and I won't go into the details about how I jumped from one to the next to the next because it's too complicated, <laughs> but I started out as a high school English teacher, became then a uh, headhunter, and then the vice president of a headhunting firm, then became a facilitator of all kinds of programs, both for personal growth and for business, and then became the chair of two groups of CEOs here in Seattle, that I ran for 13 years. And from that, that was really the the primary launching pad for Fierce. So, you know, life is very curly and you can't straighten it out and nobody's life goes in a straight line. And mine certainly didn't. You know, I've, I've found that to be so true with almost everyone I speak to, which is one of the reasons why I selfishly ask this question, because I just find it so <laughs> fascinating to hear about these different trajectories and the meandering paths that lead people to different places. And I hope to inspire the listeners to see that there are so many ways to reach your potential, and they are rarely something that you would have predicted going in. Yes. And, you know, I think people sometimes are hesitant to commit, like I have two granddaughters going into college and, you know, what should my major be? And that seems to be a very intimidating choice, but I've said to them, it doesn't matter. I mean, just pick something that you're interested in and give yourself permission to change your mind because people do change. I mean, nobody stays in a company for 50 years anymore and gets a gold watch when they retire. It's much more interesting to move as the, uh, as your soul requires you to do from time to time. Yes, it's true. So it's always been true, but now it's more possible than ever, right? It's more accepted than ever. Right. Yeah, that's right. fantastic. I love it. And and good for you. What a great and amazing career you have built. I've come across your name before meeting you. I was really fortunate to have just met you recently in March when we both attended a professional conference. Both of us were in the learning mm-hmm. scene. And so we connected and I, I feel fortunate. And before that, I was very familiar with your work because it's one of the most often quoted books and your company is extremely successful as a result of the body of knowledge that you have built, especially initially with your book, Fierce Conversations. So we only have a half hour to talk. 
and so we can't cover everything that that you have to share about the topic. But if you could summarize what you think is the most important lesson that people need to learn about having some of those conversations that lots of people want to avoid and that you've been helping people in the world have these conversations, what do you think is the most germane lesson? Well, I think I think it's, uh, you know, when we're doing a training for our clients, the first thing we do is get across the very important why are we even talking about this topic conversations. And I really want people to understand that we are all navigating our lives one conversation at a time. Our careers, our companies, our relationships, our lives are succeeding or failing gradually, 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 then suddenly one conversation at a time. So for people to even be conscious of that um, is very, very important. And most of us are not really conscious of that. So, and I think right now, um, you know, a fierce conversation is at its simplest definition. It's one in which we come out from behind ourselves into our conversations and make them real. There is a, but that's not so easy. And, and we tend to sort of set, settle on beliefs and truths and then behave as if our beliefs and truths are, um, are real. And that can cause a problem. For example, an obstacle for most of us, and I include myself here, Helleli, is that we're in love with our own beliefs, our own practices, our own way of life. And we're so convinced that they're right, that they're true, that they're irreputable, that we don't entertain the possibility that our truths may have only an element of truth in them, you know, or maybe they were true once upon a time and they're no longer true today, or they may be true in theory, but in reality, they aren't working. And I'm thinking specifically of the current political debate that's going on in the U.S. that is, you know, very, very disturbing to a lot of us. And I think that, you know, from the perspective of fierce conversations, when our when our version of the truth is cast in bronze and we suppress all evidence to the contrary by, by silencing those that we lead or silencing those who see things differently than we do, we end up continuing to practice the same old habits and often are ultimately left contemplating the ashes of our downsized opportunity because, you know, no one person is right all the time about everything. And we wonder when the next turning point is going to come along and we don't recognize we're going to incinerate that one too. And the point I I really want people to be considering today is that being strong and being right can be turn offs, not turn ons. I think that modesty is called for here. Humility I mean, you may be great, you may know a lot of stuff, but you're not that great. You don't know everything. That's true for all of us. So we need for leaders especially, but just human beings to become more open, more flexible, less egoistic, less hypocritical. And we really got to loosen our death grip on whatever we believe to be the truth simply because it's how we want the truth to look. So in a fierce conversation, one of the objectives is to provoke learning, and that's for everybody. And that means we've got to invite people to, to, to influence us by sharing uh, competing perspectives. And that's really hard. You know, I, I, I've been avoiding discussions about, um, you know, who I'm going to vote for in November because I have such strong feelings. And if I, if I said exactly what I was thinking, I'd end up apologizing half the time for the other half of the things that I said. So there are some topics that are so emotional for us that we almost have to avoid them, or we just have to be very aware of how strongly we hold our views and that other people hold very different views and learn to become curious about their thinking, you know, and just say, well, tell me more about this instead of just jumping right in and making them wrong. So it sounds like one of your prescriptions is to cultivate curiosity. Yes. Is there anything else? You know, genuine curiosity. Yes. Yeah. But we also have to, you know, really 
be willing to disclose what we're actually thinking and feeling, um, even if it may, you know, if it feels risky at times. If I if I say what I'm really thinking, if I share what I'm really feeling right now, uh, you know, there could be um, consequences. You know, it, it could make things worse than they are. It could be um, not a career enhancing move, for example. And yet, what I have found is that there is there's something within us just about everybody on the planet, there's something within us that responds to those who level with us, mm-hmm. you know, who don't suggest our compromises for us, mm-hmm. who will say, this is, this is what I believe. This is what I'm thinking. This is what I'm feeling. And I'm just as interested in understanding what you're thinking, what you're really thinking and feeling. And I'm inviting you to, push back on my thoughts. I'm inviting you to um, express uh, ideas entirely different from mine and and help me understand, you know, how you see things. Do you, do you find that this is something that everyone can do in all of their conversations or are there prerequisites like a certain level of trust or a certain level of mutual respect or maybe certain conditions of safety in order to be able to be that transparent? If, if you know, that's a really, that's a common question that I, that I get. And um, if we wait for just the right moment where we think that just the right amount of trust is there or the right amount of whatever is there and the sun, moon and stars are perfectly aligned and there's the right music in the background and there's, you know, we're just not going to have those conversations. I think we have to be, well, as Shakespeare would say, screw your courage to the sticking point and come out from behind ourselves and model what it is that we want. What, you know, because trust Trust is built one conversation at a time. It's also lost one conversation at a time. And trust requires persistent identity. That means me showing up as myself completely, consistently, all the time, every day, so that I'm not different depending on who I'm with. I mean, I'll never forget this woman in, in one of my courses in the early days who said, I, I really used to try to present the images that I thought others desired of me. So I had, you know, my image that I would project for my boss, the image I would project for my colleagues, for my customers. I'd go home, the image I would project to my family. I'd be out in the community, the image I would project to my neighbors, the image I would project to to my pastor or my rabbi or my priest or whatever. And she said, I woke up one day unrecognizable to myself. (laughs) <laughs> and I think that can happen, you know, when we're yeah. we're being so careful and waiting for conditions to be just right. And I think I think we've got to be ourselves, including with our flaws, which all of us have, uh, consistently and with good intent. That's very important, of course. And stop being so careful. I think careful conversations are almost always failed conversations because they're just postponing the conversations that really want and need to take place. Mm. And one one point I want to make, Haleli, is that fierce conversations are they do include the conversations you mentioned, where the ones we've been avoiding. Um, maybe uh, we you know we need to uh, confront somebody about their behavior, their attitude. And I've certainly never witnessed a spontaneous recovery from a bad <laughs> attitude or bad performance. So it does require a conversation. But a fierce conversation, since it's basically about being real, um, and it's you know it wants to interrogate reality and provoke learning and tackle tough challenges and enrich relationships, it can be uh, how we conduct a meeting, how we have a one-to-one where we're just exploring, uh, you know, the issues on somebody's plate. It can be praising someone. It can be letting them know specifically what it is that we love about them and appreciate about them. All of that is fierce, mm. very fierce. It's very real. And there's not nearly enough of it going around. When I think about this, I, I do, I actually have been thinking about this so much. It keeps coming up in every corner, no matter who I talk to or what I'm reading, it seems to be coming mm-hmm. up more and more. And I think it's, it's a result of the world that we live in where social media 
and maybe the millennial generation have opened up the floodgates of, and, and or no, that's the, maybe not the floodgates, but it's like the dam has been lifted that, that said you can separate your personal self from your professional self, or you can project yeah. a certain image or hide certain things. But, you know, like everybody sees us in our full glory now everywhere, right? And it's very difficult to screen or filter out certain things to certain audiences. And so that, that it's like that coming to terms with you, you have to project one uh, consistent persona everywhere. And that's going to be uncomfortable for people who maybe knew another way, another world. The people that didn't know another world don't know what the problem is probably. Well, when you say another world, what, what do you mean? I mean, the, the, those of us who have been maybe in the workplace where you did keep personal things out and you projected, oh, right. you know, yeah. you, right, you, like you came in yeah. and you had your suit and you chose very carefully what, what pictures you could put on your desk and no one knew really very much about you besides what you chose to display in your workplace and you kept your mm-hmm. mouth shut about your opinions about certain things and so on. And now, you know, you, like your, your pictures are on Facebook, your pictures are on Twitter, your, your viewpoints about politics, about every, everything's out and everyone can, almost everyone can see it. I mean, there's still people who try to keep it compartmentalized, but it's like they're just holding on to these threads that are not there anymore. Right. Well, I I will say that I I still don't understand why so many people think that the world is interested in everything that they're doing. (laughs) They have to post everything on Facebook and take a gazillion selfies, you know, as they walk down the street. But, I, you know, in talking with some of the younger people in our offices, and we have a lot of them, um, they're saying, you know, it's it's really, there's this desire to belong, a need to belong, and somehow posting yourself in some way on Facebook is saying, I'm here, I'm here, I'm still part of the tribe, you know, mm-hmm. see me, notice me, uh, um, I, I, I want to be in, um, not on the outside, and I, that I get. I do think that, um, you know, there there is such a thing as oversharing, Um in the workplace it's like okay we do have work to do and it's funny here we have a very playful culture and lots of laughing lots of teasing i mean there there's all kinds of fun things going on we've got a a happy hour uh today towards the end of the day that will be is always fun and we have work to do (laughs) so you know so so there's the chit chat and the playfulness and the let's get to work but i don't think um, I don't think there are too many secrets here. I mean, we know who's straight, we know who's gay, we know who's bi, we know everything. And it's, uh, we know who's voting for who and we, you know, we just know these things. It's not, it's not hidden and people discover very quickly that it is safe here to disclose who you really are. Um, and that you're welcome. You know, whoever you are, you're welcome as long as you model the the values that are important to success within our culture and 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 model the principles and practices that we teach to our clients um I love so, that. I, I think that that's a really good thing to point out that it's not like anything goes and everybody can be anything you can be yourself yeah. but if you're within an organization yeah. and within a certain team there are shared values that you're expected to apply. yeah yeah and we have and we have terminated people who did not model those values. Um, you know, I mean, you can, you can, Herb Kelleher, who was the founder of Southwest Airlines would tell new employees, we, we can and will fire you for a bad attitude. Hmm. You know, you, you don't get to stay here just because we've hired you. Yeah. Um, and even if you're meeting your goals, if your attitude is bad and there's something about you that just feels off, We'll say goodbye to you and wish you well somewhere else. So we do need to pay attention to how we're behaving uh, in in all of our lives. To your point, Halali, our personal lives as well as our our professional lives, because they 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 are they're pretty inseparable at times. Yeah. I mean, we we see who who someone is over time. Yeah, the whole person. Exactly. Yeah. And so I think that what, what we're agreeing on is that maybe it's raising the bar that you can't, you can't be a jerk in your personal life, right? You, you have to raise the bar and actually yeah. step up and, and be um, transparent and uh, aspire to be a great person 
in in all of your deal, in all of your interactions in all of your conversations um you can't be one way at home and one way at work where work is like no work. yeah no i mean the the real you is going to we're going to we're going to get who the real you is whether you want us to or not yeah so I mean, people have amazing radar and we just pick up what the truth is about someone pretty quickly. Yeah. You know, our, uh, one of our, one of the principles of fierce conversations is um, obey your instincts. You know, don't just notice them or pay attention to them, obey them. You, you know, we're getting these messages from this, our own private intelligence officer in our heads and our souls and our guts that's sending us messages all day long. And there's, almost always something to those messages we get. Yeah. So even if somebody's standing in front of us and saying one thing and we get the sense that they're actually saying they're going to turn right and I'm pretty sure they're going to turn left, you know, <laughs> we're usually right. We don't even know how we know these things. Yeah. In, in fact, um, the episode that will come out uh, two weeks after this one is live is about decision-making and about how you should listen to your intuition, but you should also train your intuition because there's a lot of mistakes that you make because of thinking fallacies. So it's very interesting, you know, that whole trust your instincts, but, but be careful because <laughs> they can lead you. Well, the wrong again, absolutely. Going back to the first thing I was saying about when we fall in love with our beliefs and our yeah. practices and we believe this is true and we're not open to the fact that it, maybe it isn't, or maybe yeah. it isn't entirely true. Yeah. Um, then, then we can, we won't even see the things that, um, challenge our beliefs. Yeah. We won't even see them. Yeah. You know? We have that confirmation bias. Yeah. We want to be right. We want yeah. to be right. Yeah. One, of the, one of the differentiations between a fierce leader and a not so fierce leader is that a fierce leader wants to get it right, not be right. Mm-hmm. The fierce leader wants to get it right for all of us. And right. that would mean, you know, inviting those competing perspectives and really inviting it and modeling it and, yeah. and being completely transparent and inviting that transparency from others. And then when they are transparent, for God's sakes, don't punish them, thank them. You know, even if you didn't want to hear this today, even if you feel completely differently, if you've invited people to tell you what they really think and feel, and they do consider yourself very lucky and don't mess it up by saying, well, yeah, I hear you, but, but oh and then gosh. diving right back into your own, you know, building your own case again, which is what, we do. We yeah. all of us do this. I've done it too. And then we wonder why, okay, there's no trust here because we just taught this person that when I ask you to tell me what you're really thinking, I don't really mean it. Yes. You know? Oh my gosh, that's so true. And we do. We teach <laughs> we teach with our reactions just as much as with our yeah. words and our actions. And I oh, enjoyed yeah. I enjoyed your your you have a TEDx talk about um fierce leadership. Radical and about, transparency. And about radical radical tra- tra- yeah. And that is just yeah. something that's so interesting. And it sounds like that's what we're talking about here. It is. And, and, and that's, you know, people use the word, I'm hearing the word transparency more these days than yeah. I've ever heard them before. And we're all attracted to authenticity, to transparency. And yet we tend, the mistake we make is that we think that this is about other people, that other people need to be transparent, that other people need to be authentic. You don't recognize where in our own lives we are not being transparent. We are, are being inauthentic. And so it's very important to model what it is that you say you want and then behave with grace and genuine appreciation when someone steps, you know, steps over that risky line and says, okay, you asked, here's what I, here's what worries me. Yeah. So what you know, would be, even maybe to say something like, thank you. I know that took guts to say that. Yes. And I really appreciate that you said that. Say more about it. <laughs> yes. Great. That was exactly what I wanted to ask you. Like, what do you specifically say when someone says some, confronts you or, or says something that is, you know, difficult to hear? And that is a, a great example. Thank you for sharing that. That, yeah. that took guts. Good. Thank you for saying that. Tell me more. Keep talking. You know, say yeah. more about that. Yeah, and mean it. You can't. You can't fake fierce. <laughs> no, and you can't. You're right. <clears throat> genuinely curious. Mm-hmm. Genuinely interested. Mm-hmm. Very good. Yeah. Thank, thank you for sharing that. I appreciate it. And before we you're welcome. Before we wrap up, we're going to share a very specific and actionable tip. But I want to ask you 
two quick questions before that. You, your company actually does not only offer training and consulting on how to have fierce conversations, but a whole slew of other related topics that help people become, looks like, better leaders, which is a, a focus we share in common. So of all of those, is there a favorite that you have or one that you think uh, precedes all the others? Well, I, I want to share with you the thread that runs through everything that's fierce, and that is that ultimately at the end of the day, I believe that the next frontier for spectacular growth, whether it is for an individual human being or for a team within a company or for a company itself, that next frontier for exponential growth and the only sustainable competitive edge lies in the area of human connectivity. Mm. And that occurs or fails to occur one conversation at a time. So, for example, you know, if we aren't really truly connected to our employees and they aren't connected to one another, we we have low employee engagement. If the people that are working directly with our customers and our clients aren't really connecting with our customers beyond just what it is that we do and the price that we charge for it, then we're very vulnerable as a company because our competitors just have to come in and offer something similar for less and those loyal customers are gone. Mm. You know, if what we've got going with our employees is an exchange of of time and talent for a paycheck, then we become a source for headhunters rather than a destination. And people are easy picking. It's easy to move somebody out of a company who doesn't have anything more going for it than I come here every day and do what I do and they get give me a paycheck. So, you know, really what we're doing is we're teaching people, whether we're teaching a course on negotiations or on generations or on accountability or on, you know, team conversations or confrontations or feedback or whatever it is that we're teaching, it all comes down to connecting at a deep level. And I'm, I'm telling leaders, I've been telling them for several years now that if you want to become a great leader or a great human being, you must gain the capacity to connect with the people that are important to your success and your happiness at a deep level or lower your aim. So that's, that's what Fierce is, is mostly about. And that's the thread that runs through everything that we do. That's great. I love it. I kept feeling like there's metaphors painting themselves in my mind as you were speaking, you know, about sort of like connecting fabric in order for there to be a seam, it has to be tight. And, you know, otherwise yeah. you still have big hole gaping holes in between it or like a, a sieve, you know, with, with holes and water flowing right through yeah. it, you know, it just, it makes yeah. sense. Yeah, it holds it together. Even though we're almost out of time, I have to share with you a quick a quick story and see what you think about it. Recently, I was flying to client engagement and the woman next to me on the airplane, I engaged her in conversation and she was a psychiatrist, but she said that her daughter is an employment lawyer. And so as we were talking about our work and, and this kind of topic came up, she said from her daughter's perspective, what she's hearing and what she's starting to suggest to her patience is to not share too much because everything can now be taken into a lawsuit or everything can be, you know, people are so oversensitive. And so like when you try to be real and when you try to connect in the workplace, there's so many um, mixed messages that are coming out because we have a litigious society and maybe overprotective of everyone and sort of that whole like you know <clears throat> safe space and 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 PC and and we're, we've beat out of people their willingness to be real. What do you think about that? That's right. I think that it's true that we've become that way, and the solution to that is not to be careful about what we say. You know, there are always going to be people out there just looking for a reason to be offended and people who are super sensitive and who get their feelings hurt all the time. And we let those people run the show. And it's ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous. So we've got to stop tiptoeing around the person who's easily offended or, you know, very sensitive or takes things the wrong way. And we just need to come straight to that person and say, let's sit down and talk about this. I want to talk through this. So I really, truly need to understand what you're trying to say or what you're concerned about. And, you know, we need to hear each other because I've known whole, you know, teams and companies who were totally under the thumb of one completely messed up human being mm -hmm. who had everybody taught that, you know, don't talk to me about, don't say stuff like this to me. 
or you'll be sorry. Yeah. And that's just that's just sad. I agree. So we we can't we can't let those people run the show. And yet a lot in a lot of organizations and families, I might add, mm. are doing exactly that. Yeah. It's true. Thank you. Thank you for that perspective. I, I tend to agree with you. All right. Well, what's one exciting thing that's on your horizon? What's got your attention nowadays in a real well, quick I'm, summary? Well, I'm just finishing rewriting Fierce Conversations oh. and the revised edition will come out next May. And I'm really excited about it because I have learned so much since the book was published almost 15 years ago. It will be 15 years when it comes out. So much I've learned from clients and just being alive a little bit longer. And, you know, there are new topics, even like when and where to use technology and when and where not to use technology, which is a topic that I get asked about all the time. Yes. So I'm really excited about that. Yeah, great. Oh, I can't wait for it to come out and, and to read it. That's awesome. So, uh, Susan, I appreciated all of your insights and your time. And before we tell people how to stay in touch with you, what's something very actionable that you think listeners could do right away this afternoon, tomorrow, this week to upgrade their leadership yeah. skills? Yeah. Well, one of the principles of Fierce Conversations is be here prepared to be nowhere else. Mm. And in our conversations, I, I mean, if Anybody listening to this podcast, Halali, would just do that when they're with somebody, whether they're on the phone or face-to-face or whatever it is, to be with that person in that conversation, prepared to be nowhere else. Just, you know, giving somebody the purity of your attention for however long that takes would make a huge difference. And and perhaps also giving yourself a secret rule that you're only going to ask questions once the conversation is started. You're, you're, you're not going to make any declarative statements. You're just going to ask questions to draw somebody out. Those two things, you know, really being fully present, listening, 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 asking, asking, asking could be more powerful than most people understand. Yes. And so simple and so hard to do and so important and actionable. And so important because while no single conversation is guaranteed to change the trajectory of a career or a company or a relationship or a life, any single conversation can. And we don't always know when somebody walks in the door and says, you got a minute, that this could be one of those conversations. Great. I love it. I think one of the biggest lessons from from your work and from speaking with you today is that conversations, each of them is a universe unto itself and extremely important. Like treat them with the due respect they deserve. Exactly. Because you've gotten to wherever you are in your in your life, one conversation at a time, and you're going to get to wherever you want to go in your life or don't want to go in your life one conversation at a time. So I'd like people to make them fierce and get where they want to go. Excellent. Awesome. Fabulous. And thank you. So I hope people will now be clamoring to know more about you and to learn more from you. So what's the best way for people to stay in touch and learn more about you? Well, we have a wonderful website. It's, it's just fierceinc.com. Fierceinc.com. And there is a place right there on the, uh, the homepage to sign up for our newsletters and our surveys and our suggestions and, you know, all, everything that we're doing. And, of course, we'll announce when the, the revised book comes out and all that kind of thing. But there's lots of really helpful suggestions that come out from time to time. Great. Good. Thank you. Well, I will, of course, link to that in the show notes as well as to your books and um, include your bio. Susan, it's been a pleasure to speak with you and I appreciate you. Thank you for coming on to the Talent Grow Show and sharing with our listeners. You are so welcome. Thanks for tuning in. I hope you take action on Susan's advice and I hope that you check out the show notes page where we have links and information about everything we've shared, which is talentgrow.com forward slash podcast forward slash episode 36. Sharing this with others will help me reach more people with this message and more people take action on such important advice as this. So thank you for considering sharing this episode or the podcast in general. And of course, by leaving a review and rating on iTunes, you help more people discover it through the organic search function on iTunes. So I appreciate that. Have you grabbed the free tool that I've created for you? 10 Mistakes Leaders Make and How to Overcome Them? We all know you don't want to be making these 10 mistakes. Are you? 
go check it out, grab the free tool. And that way you'll also be able to stay in touch with me through my bioweekly newsletter, which is always fast, very upbeat and definitely useful. So thank you for tuning in. I appreciate you listening to the Talent Grow Show. I'm Haleli Azulai, your leadership development strategist. And until the next time, make today great. Thanks for listening to the Talent Grow Show, where we help you develop your talent to become the kind of leader that people want to follow. For more information, visit talentgrow.com.